Um, so today we will hear our experts. There we go. We got that recording on. Uh, we will hear our experts talk about uh, CITS and its place in CCAM connected cooperative or cooperative connected and automated mobility. Um, and as I said earlier, that it's, we don't believe it's just a trend. And, uh, and um, we will hear from the speakers today where we think, why they think CCAM is important in the transition towards a connected and automated future while still keeping safety and efficiency and not least sustainability at a high level. So without much ado, um, still, uh, sorry, to remind you, please use the chat. Uh, we have had quite a success earlier in our webinars with using the chat, ask questions, because we'd like you to be involved. And, uh, and if you're not agreeing to everything, as you shouldn't, uh, please ask questions, make your statements, use your name. Um, our speakers will also reply to the chat. We will raise the chat uh, questions from the chat into the webinar because the chat is not yet recorded um, and if we don't have time to answer all the questions um, we will uh, have them uh, written out and, and 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 together with the recording and the pdfs we will share them so um, welcome to you all and uh, hope you will enjoy this session and uh, I will start with the first speaker, who is Per Lillesel from Sintef, who will take an overview about CCAM as such. So please, Per, you can share your presentation. Thank you very much uh, um, for the introduction. My name is Per Lillesel, as you said, and I'm working at Sintef, a research organization in Norway, taking part in a lot of EU activities also. I've been working in the area of ITS and CITS for quite a few years now, since actually the 1990s, in various positions. I just have to, to say before I start the presentation that most of these slides comes from the Secretariat of the CCAM Partnership, and therefore it might be that I'm not able to answer all questions about this, but anyway, we'll find an uh, answer and uh, reply to you later if that is necessary. I also say that uh, the PDF uh, file that is provided after this um, after this uh, session is a mo bit more extensive than my presentation because of the limited time. So please look in there if you are looking for more information. Then I'll start my presentation. Is it okay now? I was supposed to, to speak about uh, what is the difference between CCAM single platform, CCAM partnership and CCAM association and the, the SRIA and also the link to Horizon Europe. I tried to do this <clears throat> in a simple way. I tried to set up the history for the, the CCAM partnership in three steps. It's three slides actually. Uh, CITS and ITS has been on the agenda in Europe for many, many years, but in 2019, the European Commission launched a program called the single, CCAM Single Platform, and it was owned and managed by the Commission. It was several entities in, in the in Commission that was behind this initiative. The aim of the initiative was planning of research and pre-development programs. And this was organized in several working groups and AirTruck was also involved in the organization in the beginning. Later in 2019, the EU Commission published the first uh, orientations uh, to a strategic plan for Horizon Europe. This was the strategy for launching Horizon Europe as a framework program for research from 2021 to 2027. And this plan described a model of partnerships for various uh, subjects in the upcoming framework program. And uh, the area of uh, CITS or CCAM was one of these areas, among others, uh, for example, uh, 2 zero, which is about um, um, uh, zero emission mobility on, on roads. 
and there are other partnerships described as well on air traffic on on rail railway systems and so on but one of the partnerships described in this plan was uh, the CCAM area. Then in uh, February 2020, the European Commission invited to a stakeholder workshop on CCAM partnership in Brussels. And actually that was the start of the partnership uh, that we see today. Uh, several working group was organized and AirTruck was also involved in, in organizing this. And uh, so to say this was the start, the kickoff, but not formalized yet. Then during 2020, the CCAM partnership organized a set of workshops and also divided the work in seven different clusters or groups and invited to a series of workshops with the aim of drafting a strategic research and innovation agenda also called SRIA. And this um, this RIA was a plan of important topics for future uh, R&D in the area. The work uh, with this plan was uh, finalized in November 2020 and sent to the European Commission. And then it's uh, taken more into formalization because in, uh, in April this year, uh, 14 of April, if I don't remember wrong, uh, the first uh, General Assembly of the CCAM partnership was held. It was a digital event with initially 144 members in the partnership. And the cluster leaders and uh, the steering board of the partnership was elected at this uh, General Assembly. Uh, the CCAM partnership will work in future developing the, the strategic plan and also make recommendations to the European Commission for the next uh, topics to be funded by the partnership and, and uh, to be funded as R&D projects by the Commission. So what is the link then? Uh, the CCAM association is the same as the partnership, so to say, but the CCAM association is necessity because it's a legal entity that is registered in Brussels and this is uh, you need to have this to, to have an organizational number to have a bank account and stuff like that and the formal part of the association is to sign uh, the link between the CCAM partnership and agreement with the European Commission. So the CCAM partnerships is all the members but the association is representing the members and the partnership when it comes to, to agreements and, and signing a memorandum of understanding with the EU Commission. And what is the link from this work to, to then uh, the, the Horizon Europe work program? And uh, the SRIA, the document, strategic document that was developed is, is about 70 pages and describes a lot of objectives and also necessary R&D actions to achieve these uh, objectives. It was sent to the, to the Commission and the Commission has used it uh, rather extens extensively in, in, in forming and, and writing the, the work program for the next years and what research topics and calls you can find there. You can when it comes to CCAM, you can also find a link back to the strategy document. So I think that the CCAM partnerships has a very important role when it comes to advising the EU Commission on what needs to be have for R&D projects in, in the future. Now I'll try to rush through in, in six, seven minutes uh, the, the main uh, content of this strategic plan and the partnership what they have provided of information so far. The vision and the expected impacts of the CCAM uh, partnership is uh, of course to address the major um, challenges when it comes to, to transport and it's uh, safety of course and the environmental issues. It's also about uh, inclusiveness when to ensure inclusive mobility and uh, for goods and people and uh, also to strengthen uh, the European industries in the competition, global competition when it comes to technological leadership 
and uh, in assuring long-term growth and, and jobs. And the overall vision for the partnership is to, to, to put Europe in a leading position when it comes to safety and sustainable road transport through automation. But there are some challenges, and this is also described in, in the strategic document, of course. Uh, I think the situation today is, is that uh, the society is not uh, prepared for this change yet. And it's not the sufficient demand for the new technology and, or for the change that CCAM solutions will provide. Uh, I also think that there is not a market uh, that is mature enough today to take up the technologies and the in, in, uh, innovations that are that we see see today. Uh, also, uh, are pointed out that the R and I actions and efforts done so far are a bit uh, fragmented, and it's not uh, not um, you cannot see a long term vision and a strategy behind it. It's more like popping up projects here and there and uh, bits and pieces. So it's not an overall strategy for this. And also demonstrations and pilots so far needs to be scaled up to larger and also to handle more complexity than we have seen so far. The work in the CCAM partnership is, as I mentioned, divided in, in seven clusters. And these clusters are uh, large scale demonstrations. It's about vehicle technology, uh, validation of systems and integration in vehicle the vehicle in the transport systems, uh, key enabling technologies, and also addressing societal aspects and user needs. And then you have a, a cluster that is looking at coordination of all these activities. And I think that uh, what we see different this time from, from previous uh, uh, calls uh, is not only a focus on technology, but if we are going to success with the implementation of CCAM, user needs and the societal acceptance and aspects is very crucial. So social sciences will play a large, more uh, important role in, in the future programs that are going to be launched from the EU Commission. I don't have time to go into this in details, but you're able to look at, it, at the details because there is a description of each cluster here and also some R&D actions that are needed to, to fulfill them. But uh, large scale demonstrations is about three levels. It's going from pilots, single use cases and limited uh, operational design domains, uh, or going to, to field operational tests and finally into living labs when you combine a lot of use cases and try to use the technology and, and the systems in a wide area of uh, operational design domains. When it comes to vehicle technology, there is a focus on, on, uh, on developing uh, perception technologies for CCAM and also to, to build the safe and reliable onboard decision-making technologies the human machine interface is also addressed in this uh, in this cluster and i think that a lot of, of the the coordination between vehicle and the people are addressed in this cluster then it comes to the validation uh, if we are going to to look at systems and and have tests in in situ or in the real world I think that conversional uh, validation approaches would require hundreds or millions of test kilometers for high levels of automation. So they are setting up procedures and methodology and, and also tools to, that are needed to validate uh, all the experiments that we are going to do in this uh, system. The integration uh, of the vehicle into the transport system is about the, the infrastructure 
uh, what's needed, telecommunication, uh, backend systems, and, and also system integration. Uh, the, we also need to look at the infrastructure, what is required for future uh, systems from the infrastructure and road operators side. So here we're going to work with different methodologies and also looking at what kind of operational design domains is suited for CCAM vehicles. Then there is a focus on, on key enabling technologies and I, I skipped to, to some of the RNI actions and uh, cyber security is an important uh, issue for components and systems at all. Uh, how to build robustness and resilience into uh, CCAM systems, and also uh, looking at the uh, use of artificial, artificial intelligence and how to create awareness uh, with artificial in intelligence that are able to, to look at different uh, situations and uh, recognize them and uh, avoid uh, dangerous uh, and or hazard situations that might occur. System architecture for data sharing as well is just in this cluster. Uh, then we have the cluster six, which uh, addresses the societal uh, aspects and, and the user needs. And uh, this is a widely description of, of what is needed for for developing CCAM systems from a, a societal aspect and also from a user aspect, what is needed for people to accept and to start using this kind of technology. And finally, the, the cluster seven is addressing the coordination part of this and tries to bring everything together, also providing, providing uh, databases for, for sharing data, for sharing knowledge that is uh, that is um, aggregated from all these uh, trials and, and projects that are going to be to be done over the coming years. So uh, the overall picture is that the CCAM calls under Horizon Europe will be uh, launched by the Commission and it's not a close partnership uh, in that sense that everyone or all kind of consortia either you are a member or not can apply for projects on the on the horizon europe but i think that the partnership will play a major role when it comes to facilitate networks to building stakeholder communities and also update the strategic plan and give input and advice to the commission when it comes to what kind of r d topics should be on the list and also defining uh, impacts of projects and results results. So I think that the partnership will work uh, hand in hand more or less with the EU Commission when it comes to the future of R&D in, in the CCAM area. So what are the stakeholders? This is the final slide. Uh, what is the stakeholders that are in this partnership today? You have representation from the industry, from public authorities and road operators. Also, mobility and uh, logistic service providers are invited and present at, in the network. And also different uh, representative bodies. It, it might be other associations that are in here. We have regulatory bodies, both, both national, uh, European and international, and also research organizations and universities. So all this uh, six uh, different categories comes together and work in common with solving the uh, issues in the future years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Per, for that. Um, I know you said in the beginning that uh, this was a presentation given to you, so it's not your presentation as such, but can I ask you this? Because uh, Sintas has joined the partnership and, and, uh, and um, and you're a member of that association as well. Where do you see yourself fitting into that vision CCAM has and, and, and clusters? Is there any specific cluster you would like to um, put more emphasis to? CDF is a large organization and I think it's depend on <laughs> which part of CDF you're asking. I, I'm sure that we have some uh, colleagues that are 
are deep into to cyber security and deep into technology development in vital technology and stuff like that sensors but from from our department i think the main focus is on on the on the user needs and so societal acceptance of this kind of systems it's the integration between the humans and the technology and how what is needed to 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 bring this together and to to get the, the acceptance from from the public for using this and i also think that that norway has has absolutely a, a, a pre or, or an advantage when it comes to to a lot of these projects in the future because we have a high presentation of, of electric vehicles uh, that is one thing for sure but i think the other one is uh, when it comes to operational uh, design domains which surroundings which uh, type of, of environment can you use this uh, uh, self-driving cars or autonomous systems in and when it, if it works in Norway with the, the standard of, or road network and also the weather conditions that we have here it will work everywhere so I think that is one of the things that uh, we Norwegians can bring into this. Excellent. Um, thank you for that, Per. Um, as I said also in the beginning, uh, ITS Norway also joined the, the mm -hmm. partnership because we find this uh, important task to deliver um, the message also out to the industry, which we also represent as a member organization. And also coming back to one of your points saying finding the mature markets and how the technology can involve and, and be used. Um, thank you, Per. Uh, we will move on into the program and we will hear from Bjorn Illness from Aventi, who will talk more about the C uh, in CITS and CCAM. And is it the same technology? Bjorn, yes. please share uh, your presentation and welcome. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Good. Yes, my name is Bjorn Elnes and I work for Aventi and we uh, provide a lot of uh, projects for the Norwegian Public Road Administration, typical tunnels and bridges on our highways, but we also participate in a lot of the R&D activities around CITS. I would like to start out with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The goals at the foundation will help us uh, take good care of our planet. The second layer helps us take care of our society and the third layer will give us a healthy economy. And CCAM supports at least four of these goals. Here I have tried to illustrate the functional areas of CCAM and how they loosely relate to each other. This corresponds to the functional areas in the CCAM Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda and the Horizon Europe Work Program. The, on, the only functional area that I have added myself is the digital platforms. I have not added artificial intelligence or 5G, 5G technology as, this, as um, their own functional areas because these are technical components that can support all functional areas. Here we see some components for each functional area, but uh, as you see, none of them fit neatly into one box. So over here we have the traffic management centers. Uh, they produce, uh, let's say, uh, data information, which is then consumed by companies like here and maybe Uber and, and Google Maps. And it may be uh, made available through the national access point. Here's the Norwegian national access point, transportportalen.no. So um, eventually this digital uh, road infrastructure will become a digital twin of our roads and the traffic on our roads. Uh, this data can be presented to the vehicles, whether it's uh, traffic alerts or, or virtual street signs uh, through, the, um, through the physical road infrastructure. Now, there's, uh, there's different opinions, but what is the digital road infrastructure and what is physical road infrastructure? So this is uh, my opinion. So I have added the roadside units here and, and the cellular towers, which needs to be in the area. In addition, we have, for instance, uh, RTK base stations. They have to be physically placed along the road um, and it's called um, road furnitures or, or road equipment. Uh, these uh, 
old fashioned uh, street signs, they are clearly physical road infrastructure and the street markings that needs to be improved for, autom uh, for automated vehicles to, to see them. Uh, eventually though, the, uh, the digital twin in, in the digital road infrastructure will be transmitted uh, into the vehicles, either through uh, uh, short range communication, ITS G5 or long range uh, cellular communication, or they can, the data can come directly from uh, traffic, uh, traffic lights, telling if it's red, green or, or, or yellow light. And here I placed uh, a camera that can see pedestrians and then it sends out messages to the vehicles if there are mess, uh, pedestrians or bicycles in, in the area. The cybersecurity will uh, be provided by um, either by the car OEMs themselves in their backend systems or from the European um, CCMS. Now we transition over to the concept of co corporate intelligent transport systems and its relevant components. So I left a few of the components in here. So we have the, the traffic management center, we have the, the cell phones, our personal uh, um, devices, we have the, the cellular network, the short range ITS communication, the, the trusted uh, security and, uh, and the vehicle itself down here. And here we see the old classic CITS illustration from the ISO 212217 and ETSI EN 3026655 standards. I made a note of that down here. And these were published in 2010, and that's 11 years ago. So it looks uh, very old fashioned here. But this is what we've been working towards all these years within the CITS community. Here I have uh, modernized and simplified uh, the figure a little bit. I have emphasized, uh, in addition, I have emphasized the uh, cellular communication and the European Union's uh, CITS security credential management system by placing them in the middle. These two components were parts of the standards back in 2010 as well, but has become more important the last uh, five years. Ever since 2010, the CITS standards have suggested that all forms of wireless communication could be used, including inf infrared and Bluetooth, but most development until now has focused on the uh, 5.9 gigahertz uh, uh, ITS G5 short range communication. This was challenged in 2016 with PC5 from Qualcomm and, and Huawei, which I mentioned over here. In addition, long range cellular communication is important because we can't cover all of Europe with 5.9 gigahertz roadside units. Just to broadcast general traffic information. So these arrows, I'll explain the arrows. You have the caption down here. So here we have the traffic uh, management center or, or the backend system, which is the central ITS station. It can transmit uh, uh, traffic information using regular fiber or copper to the roadside unit and the roadside unit will then communicate to the vehicle using the short range 5.9 gigahertz communication. Now these two vehicles, they can communicate between themselves to avoid collisions using the 5.9 uh, gigahertz communication. Uh, here we see that the, the, the central ITS station can also choose to communicate with the roadside unit using a, a, a cellular 4G modem. We've done that in several tests. And, uh, and it can communicate with the vehicle also using the cellular communication. This is still missing from the CITS though. We have not uh, standardized this. So that's still some uh, remaining work to do, especially for this personal ITS station. The, it's really hard to get the, the cellular um, phones into this e ecosystem right now. They could of course easily make cell phones that would talk 5.9 gigahertz ITS G5 because it's, it's based on the regular Wi-Fi standard, which is already in the phones, but there's been no market for it. So of course they have not done it so far. Now this slide is a pitch from my side, promoting CITS hybrid communication using MQTT. Similar solutions have been tested in several European CITS pilots. This one is from the Norwegian E8 Borealis project. 
Here we see the vehicle receiving information from both the ITS G5 and, and the cellular uh, communication at the same time. So MQTT, that's a, a message queue that's uh, very common in, um, in IoT applications and, and uh, the vehicles, they are like one big IoT device. So this works uh, beautifully to use this MQTT communication. The MQTT is standardized in, in this document here from ISO 29922. <clears throat> here we see that the traffic management center, the roadside units and the vehicle onboard unit, all are clients to the MQTT server. Each um, CITS station publish and subscribe to relevant topics in their geographic region providing a flexible and future-proof solution. Then I'll talk about some of the standardized uh, CITS messages. I've illustrated this here with a, with a old-fashioned GPS, which is giving you the location. Here it's an old-fashioned text TV traffic alert from Norway, a speed limit sign, a little map piece of an intersection and um, a traffic light. And the corresponding CITS messages is CAM, DEM, IVI, MAP, and, and SPAT. I'm not going to dive into the actual abbreviations, but here we can see the content of these messages. And that this is the important part of CITS, to standardize the content of the messages. When a vehicle transmit or receive messages, it's actually transmitting and receiving this cryptic part down here. But we can parse out the information, and, and then we can see it here in this uh, programming tool. So here we see that this is a passenger car. This is the, the location. If it says unknown, that means it's an unknown uh, direction on the sky, like north, northwest. So it's not unknown location. It's just, it's not northwest or south or anything like that. So these are the GPS uh, coordinates. <coughs> here we have a, a traffic alert. And if we look down here, we can figure out what is this. This is roadworks. It says roadworks right here. Here we have a traffic sign, and what traffic sign could, could this be? Let's see. Uh, immediate uh, danger, and down here says icy road. So this is a, a VS, VMS board, actually. And then we have some map information with different lanes, and then we have a, a traffic light the message. And if we look down here, it says uh, event state stop and remain, which means you have a red light. So that's very convenient for automated uh, vehicles like those autonomous buses we've seen. <clears throat> How am I doing on time, Jenny? Sorry, Sorry you're, you're doing, doing just, just fine. fine. All right. So uh, here we see a few uh, CITS use cases, and I'll go through a few of them, not all of them. Here we have um, a bus, it can send a, a request that it needs priority and then the traffic light controller from Svarko or Siemens or Dynic can decide if, if it should give green light to this direction here and then the bus can pass. This, uh, this is an old fashioned diesel truck. Uh, well, old fashioned, it has an old fashioned engine but it's got all this new CITS stuff on board. So it can turn off its engine while it's waiting for a green light and then it can crank up the engine a couple of seconds before it gets the green light. This vehicle here is uh, experiencing a slippery road, so it sends out the message to alert uh, other drivers. Here is a pl plow truck. It sends out an alert, alert to all the drivers in the area that it's uh, clearing this, the snow. This vehicle has crashed, so it's sending out an alert. I have crashed, and here comes a vehicle around the curb. And, and then it will receive this message and um, the driver can be take uh, precaution. This is this is the demo that uh, Austria did for um, for the Golf 8 when this car was stranded in woods and this other Golf came around the curb. And here we have the trams. They can avoid uh, collisions uh, by monitoring the location of other vehicles and other vehicles can mo monitor the location of the tram. This traffic light here transmits a DEM message when a pedestrian pushes the button to tell other people that there are pedestrians in this area. This vulnerable road user, if we can get the, the personal ITS station, also the cell phone included in this ecosystem, can send out alerts that he is, he is riding his bike or she is riding her bike right here. 
this uh, 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 automated minibus receives uh, a space message, so it knows that it has uh, a green light over here. This ambulance, it sends a request that it needs a green light in this intersection. Here is an RSU in this, this intersection, and it detects this, uh, this uh, car here that is driving in the wrong direction. So it's sending out the dem message to alert the other drivers. Uh, the, the RSU also detects that there's a lot of traffic in, in this lane here. So it sends out the dem to this fire truck and tells it that this road here is, is pretty much blocked because of all the traffic. This ambulance it sends out the dem message to these vehicles here and tell them to, to, to pull over to the side so it can continue. Uh, here we have a, a camera that's sitting by this, uh, this pedestrian crossing and it detects that there are pedestrians uh, in the road, so it sends out the dem to alert the other drivers, or it can send out uh, a, a CPM message, which is really a list of all the vehicles and bikes and pedestrians in this area. And that can be received by these trucks here, so they can take precaution. And here we have a tunnel with uh, maybe some buses and also some trucks with dangerous goods, so we can track and position the, the buses and the dangerous goods through the, through the tunnel to make sure that everybody has a, a safe travel. Here we have, uh, here the backend system sends out the IVI message, which is actually the, the content of these traffic signs. And here we have the SAM, that's a service announcement message, which can be used for special cases like road user charges, studded tire fees that we have here in Oslo, low emission zones, border crossing, travel time reports, truck way in motion, booking or parking, charging stations, and, and much more. Very few have uh, looked into using the SAM messages, but uh, Aventi has done a lot of work in this respect. So that brings me to my final slide here and what I was supposed to talk about today, the two C's in the in CCAM. The first C is connected, and of course this is wireless connectivity. Then we have the long range internet communication via the cellular network, 4G or 5G. And we have short range uh, automotive communication via the 5.9 gigahertz frequency band, and that's the ITS G5 or the PC5. Uh, the other C is cooperative. Then we need trusted data exchange using the EU CCMS. Again, we have uh, long range communication, uh, vehicle to network. And this could be real-time traffic information, but uh, the same uh, long-range communication, which, which is a SIM card in the, in the vehicle, will be used to download uh, uh, high-definition high maps, over-the-air software updates, and it's also used for the e-call to transmit an SMS. The short-range communication, then we have the V2V communication, that's between two vehicles, and that's to avoid uh, collisions. So if two two cars are in the same area on a collision course, then they can in the future maybe automatically engage the brakes to avoid a collision. The V2I vehicle to infrastructure, then we can have um, traffic lights. Here it's signal timing and priority. And we can also alert about uh, wrong way drivers. The V2P, this is vehicle to pedestrian. And that's to keep uh, pedestrians and, and bicycles safe in, in our cities and also along our, our uh, rural roads. A lot of kids walk along uh, dangerous dark roads in Norway going to school. Then we have the collection, uh, collective perception, and this can be a, a traffic camera in an intersection that has a bird's eye view that it can share with the uh, automated vehicles and also regular conventional vehicles. Cooperative maneuvers, this could be automatic metering and merging onto freeways, platooning and, and other uh, ways of, of um, making the automated vehicles uh, work together. Note, uh, to make all these short range uh, f uh, use cases work, we need ac very accurate positioning. If you drive downtown uh, a city today, maybe your positioning is plus minus a couple of meters and, and that's not good enough. So we need better positioning. Uh, we all already have the GNSS, the GPS systems, which can be augmented with RTK, but that doesn't necessarily work in urban canyons and in tunnels. Then we need some of the uh, other means, maybe real-time location systems, and, and combined with inertial measurement units. 
if you read the HC and ISO uh, specifications for positioning and timing, you'll learn more about this. So that's my presentation, Yanni. Excellent, Bjorn. Thank you so much. That was very extensive. Um, I have a question here about digital, digital and physical infrastructure. Do you foresee that it will be more merged in the future? Because currently you have just two lines, uh, one digital, one physical, but um, will you see them merging more? It, well, they will not merge. It will just be a matter of how you define what's physical and what's digital. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a, right now, a, a, a traffic camera is defined as a physical infrastructure. Of course, it's right next to the road, but of course it has a lot of digital features within it. The cameras uh, we mount in, in the road tunnels, they have artificial intelligence and can recognize people walking in the tunnel and, 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 and a lot of things. So, um, all these boxes that I showed here, the, the borderline between them will be blurry. Um, we will not uh, deep dive into the communication part as such because we did that quite uh, uh, extensively last time in our uh, webinar that you can find on our, on the website from ITS Norway as uh, the recording is there. But um, can you just say two words? Because when you show the use cases, the last, uh, the next and uh, almost last slide about use cases from CITS, where does the like the hybrid communication uh, come into those use cases? Is there a slide that kind of explains that as well? Yeah, so the the, the slide right after I try to show what's uh, long range and short range mm -hmm. communication. So the short range communication where you need the, the message to arrive uh, maybe directly from the traffic light, whether it's uh, red, uh, yellow or green, that that could be solved by short range communication. There's a lot of discussions uh, which use cases cases really need short range communication. Maybe we'll end up with uh, that you only need short range communication to avoid collisions. But the, in this presentation, I tried to list up more use cases for short range communication. Mm -hmm. uh, would be interesting to hear from our audience as well. Any comments on that? Um, and uh, Aventi is very much inter interested as well in the CCAM partnership. Uh, why, do you, why is Aventi interested in, uh, in, in CCAM? Well, Aventi for, for, for a long time has provided the Norwegian Public Road Administration with, uh, with the instrumentation in our road tunnels. We have uh, mm -hmm. 1,400 road tunnels in Norway and a lot of them are very intelligent with the camera systems that I mentioned and uh, they have like uh, redundant uh, IT, uh, IP phone systems and we can control them of course from the traffic management center. So we are already providing uh, ITS solutions and then of course it's natural to to get involved in CITS and then eventually CCAM. So have you started to look at the CCAM uh, Horizon Europe calls to see if there's anything interesting there for uh, for uh, to continue this uh, this let me say this trend? Yeah, so the, the the Horizon Europe CCAM calls regarding physical and digital infrastructure is of course very interesting for us and also the large scale demonstrators. Thank you, Bjorn, so much. Um, we had some questions about use, uh, use case descriptions available, please. I see that Knut Evansen has already um, sent a link to answer that there's some of them are defined there. And then also Daniel has also shared some um, um, uh, um, links to where to find those use cases. Um, in the chat, I would like to know uh, about your relationship to CCAM. If your company or organization has joined CCAM, why have you done so? And what do you kind of see that vision to um, the vision for CCAM and it fulfills your kind of uh, uh, goals? So that would be great just to note on that if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind. Um, great. Thank you so much, Bjorn, for your um, presentation. Uh, we will move straight towards uh, a lady, uh, Jacqueline Erhardt from uh, Astnag, and uh, she will talk about, uh, among others, about automated driving and ESAT. Please, uh, Jacqueline. I think you just need to unmute and then we're perfect. Perfect. Good. Thank you very much for inviting. Um, my name is Jacqueline Erhardt. I'm working for ASFINAC, um, which is the Austrian motorway operator. And um, 
in, in this case and, and webinar series, I think it's worth mentioning it that Asfinac has already the first CITS services in operation and is going really um, the path towards a full deployment, which means for us mobile um, trailers to be connected, which already works fine. Um, we are also planning to go into operation with stationary um, roadside units by next year, and we are also equipping our fleets um, with roadside units, so we will also have road operator vehicles by 2023 in operation. So we are really going this way um, towards automated driving and also um, cooperative um, ITS. And therefore, we, we think it's really worth um, discussing the topic today of um, road infrastructure support levels for automated driving, since we, we need to be really prepared for um, the future. Let me just share my screen. Perfect. So um, when we think about roads of the future, um, we, we really have to think about the integration of the vehicle in the whole transport system. So this ecosystem sometimes is a little bit, um, a little bit when people think about it, it's not a singularity. It's not only about roads. It's not only about traffic regulations or traffic management. It's not only about vehicles, but it's just a mix out of everything. Um, we, we cannot expect that the future will be autonomous by just in a second. So we need to a little bit also see how can we enable um, higher levels of automation on exactly safer roads, more sustainable roads, more efficient roads, and that is the talk I will give today. So I start with just a little bit of um, our past. We, we were always thinking about emerging technologies. In the 20s of the last century, um, we thought like um, that the, the connectivity will be an enabler to, to manage autonomous um, driving uh, little boxes around the roads. Um, well, we thought quite in the early stage about connectivity, but in the 50s, we thought like, oh, no, we will have the roads, um, which will have like autopilots, like hands off and, and the car will do whatever it can do and on separate roads. Um, how does the reality look like in, in our century? Well, we, we have roads, but they are conventional and connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles on using the same roads. Um, and we need to, to manage together um, those challenges. Um, and, and when we see, we, we have um, heard in, in the very first presentation a lot about operational design domains. Um, and about that we have to get um, a better understanding of operational design domains. But just let me just introduce um, this idea for all who might not have been already in touch with operational design domains. An operational design domain can be defined for each and every brand on a different way. Um, even for, for different maybe um, circumstances, the ODD may change. So it's nothing static. It's something which is defined, which is influenced by the, the environment, which is influenced also by the roads, and um, which is, may also be influenced by the type of roads you're driving on. So when you imagine you, you take your car from home and want to drive to, to your office, um, maybe on, on the first stage, on the first mile of, of your um, way, um, your autonomous driving functionality will not work. But as soon as you are entering the highway, um, then you can go on an autopilot. But what happens really if, if some different um, situations happen and the car gives back the control to the human driver? So those are the, the situations um, which I think the, the vehicle's perception may a little bit leak off of alternatives because maybe the data is not sufficient to really take a machine decision and, and drive on in a certain level of automation. So how do we handle, I call it local missing ODDs, um, in a way? So what happens if we have a local road zone, which can happen all the time, um, what happens if, if you have just different um, densities of, of traffic? What happens if, if there's strong rain? Um, how can you and, and um, what is the, the opportunity of data and connectivity to solve those issues? So therefore, um, there was a scheme introduced 
which is called the ISAT um, scheme, which is about the, the infrastructure being an enabler to provide different kind of um, classification levels and classification levels in a mean of which kind of digital information, digital service the road can contribute to the vehicle's um, sensor data collected. So um, not to assume when we did discuss in the CCAM um, environment and also partnership about um, a lot of digital infrastructure, a lot of about physical infrastructure, we, we might have to differentiate um, between different segments of the road. Some parts are maybe um, not necessary to equip them with specific infrastructure because they're straight, they're, there's nothing happening over there, or maybe even if there is a local road zone, you can really um, detect it from, from hundreds of meters be already before because it's, it's straight and, and everything is fine. Um, but we come, if we get, what happens if we come to, to um, very difficult intersections where you have a lot of ramps on, ramps off, um, a lot of traffic? Um, what kind of, of additional services does the infrastructure maybe be able to provide to support the, um, the vehicles? So to give you a little bit more insights in, in what I, I mean with the different segments and, and different um, kind of, of classification and, and infrastructure provided, we all start with conventional infrastructure. So to, to just read the lane markings, to, to read the static um, message sign, to, to get the road geometry, that's this conventional layer. So that's what is state of the art everywhere in, in the world, but can be different, of course. Um, but what is then the next step everyone um, can, in fact, um, provide if there is, a, um, in fact, the, the ICT available, but to have a kind of digital map um, contribution, that's still something more than you might have on, on some roads. But then we are entering into the digital um, infrastructure where we talk about providing dynamic digital information. So um, the infrastructure side um, will have all the static and dynamic information, which can be provided in any form and any digital form to the automated vehicles. And on the vehicle side, um, they can receive it. So that would be um, an ISAT classification C. If you increase the, the level of um, perception by the infrastructure to do it on a cooperative base to, to provide CATS day one services, for example, and, and you have information about the microscopic traffic situations, you have even increased this level. And if you do more, if you do real guiding, if you re do really corporate driving, you're in the highest level um, in, in this scheme. What is the way in, in Austria? In Austria, we, we have started the CTS deployment with um, road safety relevant use cases, but we will continue the path towards even this corporate driving um, messages. So um, in, in our deployment map, we have already included all the services which can guide you, which may provide platoon support, which um, will give a kind of um, situation-based distance gap information and or contextual emergency corridor information. So all that information which might is missing to really enable automated vehicles to drive for the whole away in an autonomous mode. A little bit to go into detail, because I know it's it's difficult um, to, to understand how ODDs and ISAT can work together in a digital ecosystem. Let's just get into a first um, basis scenario. So what you see here um, is on, on the one hand, the travel distance um, on the X axis and on the Y, uh, you see the ODD requirements. And this light blue um, um, shape is, is what is, in fact, the possibility of, of driving safely, um, which is a combination out of the green um, part, which is the operational design domain, which is maybe stable for rural and highways here, and quite weak for the city environments, which are really a complex environment. And then, Specific on um, the highway, you will add certain um, 
capabilities of the infrastructure to provide additional um, information. And so by adding, in fact, the, the different sources of information and even additional or maybe even on, on to, to extend the perception of the vehicle, since the infrastructure has this bird's view, um, you may be able to, to handle specific um, areas like in, in the very first one um, on the highway, but then maybe the, the infrastructure maybe has no um, digital or dynamic information um, available um, due to since there's no service level agreement that we have it 100%, but maybe only 50%. So at that moment, you're just decreased. Um, and you're not able to drive there on a kind of, of um, autonomous um, way and you have to do a handover maneuver. But when you then go further on the highway and you're entering a zone where you provide a lot of information, a lot of, of um, connected CITS messages, then you're able to, to manage congestion areas um, till and then you come to a red zone, you, you enter a, a changed road layout, which where maybe the even the inf infrastructure cannot provide you sufficient information to take machine-based decisions. So how could you just, um, there are two solutions in, in how to handle then those um, ODD gaps or, or difficult traffic situations where you need um, more information. Um, and that is, on the one hand, of course, um, you increase the, the ODD. So maybe you, you have more sensor systems or um, even an, another um, back-end information. So, so you, you just collect more information. You have a better base and, and you can even go um, then again still with, with the support of infrastructure um, and, and, and foster congestion and change of rate, um, road layout situations. The other solution is as well um, that you have even a higher um, infrastructure support and to, to then really um, manage those, those situations. And although your ODD is not that high, you derive um, or you can collect a lot of information from the infrastructure, which helps you always keeping in mind that we need this secure and safe system and also that we have for um, the automated driving functionalities to, to think about the functional safety of the whole ecosystem. So in fact, what um, the idea and, and also the CCAM um, partnership and, and the ongoing um, CCAM Horizon Europe calls are asking for to really work on, on this um, joint ecosystem in working on, on which, how can we uh, define ISAT functionalities, what kind of data and in, in what quality and in, which, in with, with which frequency, on which parts of the segments um, should we have infrastructure support or where is it really required and where is it just uh, nice to have. And so, um, I want to, to end my talk um, with this, this small video about um, how mixed traffic management with CITS could look like in a way um, that we have some connected, maybe some conventional vehicles, some autonomous vehicles, and we will provide as much information as we can so that all cars, all vehicles drive safely through roadwork zones and, and other traffic situations. Um, just by, by this interaction. And that's also the CCAM partnership is for that all stakeholders together build up a system which works safely and sustainable um, and also quite sufficient and efficient. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was a very thorough presentation and very uh, good explained. Um, there's been some uh, comments in the chat um, I think it has uh, been answered, but I still want to just raise if you, to hear if there are any thoughts from your side. There's one question that said, should the ISAT digital information come from the road operators in each country or the vehicle OEMs? I mean, the, the ISAT information is meant to be um, a road information. So the vehicles already have their ODDs and, and maybe also their the backend services. Um, but here it is, um, the, the, at least the, the starting point of thought was that traffic management has to be also be combined in the ecosystem. 
So we, we can consider that the OEMs have their own solutions, but never forget that there are road operators which are in charge of traffic management out there. And, and it's not, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will not have an autonomous traffic um, by, by next year. We will have a mixed traffic. So we will have this conventional driving part as well in, in, in how we, we have to consider SECAN. Uh, thank you. The next question would be, could teleoperation for automated vehicles stranded outside their ODD play a role in ISAD? Well, yes, I think so. Definitely. That, that's a good thought. Okay. How do you, what do you see the main challenges now? Um, and, and then explaining this obviously to the public and, 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 and also and in the, to the standardization, but what do you see the main challenges from your perspective? I think the main challenge is really to, to understand the requirements on, on infrastructure services, which automated um, vehicles will need. So it, it's not only like separate the, the road operators and, and the vehicle manufacturers, um, since in fact, that both systems have to work together and jointly. So the main challenge will be that we really define very good ISAT functionalities and also find a common and harmonized um, setup of, of use cases, um, which we can deploy together. Because just if one side deploys something or the other side deploys something, I think there will be no joint um, goal reached in the end. Thank you. There's maybe going a little bit into my question, but what are the biggest and most urgent pain points that CITS and CCAM is addressing from your perspective? Um, I think especially when it comes to, to handover situations. Um, Asvenag is quite active in, in R&D projects and also in, in a project which is called Hadrian, where we also investigate this um, human interaction and handover zones, because we are interested especially there, where is um, the, the pain point of, and, and how we can enable and continue this automated driving functionalities without having some, some, some strange um, vehicle behaviors due to handover situations. Mm. Excellent, Jacqueline. Uh, there was still one comment, but that uh, that comment actually requires, I think, a webinar on its own, uh, and it's actually about um, an uh, automated and an autonomous and the, the difference uh, definition there. But that is a discussion that can be taken on many levels. So unless you, Jacqueline, want to comment on on that. Um, uh, we shall take that up on an, uh, another topic, actually. Uh, so thank you, Jacqueline, for your time. Very good. I'm very pleased to have you here today. Thank you very much. Um, we will uh, move on um, to the next presenter. We have heard from him before in our previous uh, CITS webinars. Um, but for you that have not heard about him, it's Thierry Ernst and from Yogo Co. K K -O. <laughs> Uh, Thariv, welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you. So this is a pleasure from, for, to, to be here, and uh, thanks for your, uh, your nice introduction. So I'm going to share my screen, and I don't know why. I don't see it. It's uh, okay. I know what I need to do, I guess. Sorry for that. This is always uh, amazing. And that's why we always have the testing in 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 uh, before, but it's uh, it's it's uh, you never know what happens to technology. And in case yeah. you have an issue, I can always share your presentation. There we go. Uh, and can you see it now? Is it okay? No, we what, cannot. So what do you see then? No, we see you. Oh, only me. Okay, I need. <laughs> well, it's not only. It's a, it's. A... It was working fine before. So what's the problem now? I don't know. Sorry for that. I'm finding this. Okay, let's do the second try. Okay, it's not on the same on the good screen. It was working before, so I, even though you, we do the nice checking, it's uh, sometimes not sufficient. So this is annoying. Yes. Well, I will see if I can pull it up here 
and then you can just let me know with next slide and I'll um, sorry and I'll um, sorry there and you can just um, let me know when to shift slides. Okay, let's do that that way. Okay, so uh, so I'm I'm Thierry Hans from uh, Yogoco. Um, um, it's a company uh, developing solution for cooperative ITS, so V2X, connectivity, security, etc. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, explain what's the, uh, the, the the context of security or the security platform uh, for automated vehicle. So basically, first thing we need to understand is and all the, the presentation that we already had before uh, go uh, along the same line is that we, we we are in the world of cooperative IT services and those services uh, require the share of information between different types of vehicles with the roadside infrastructure, with pedestrians, urban infrastructure, etc. So there is a real need to. Uh, 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 combine this information and to extend this information in the most efficient way. And this is what we call cooperative ITS as a generic uh, 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 <clears throat> word for sharing uh, data between all those uh, domains who are not used to communicate together. You can go to the next one, please. So uh, this exchange of information, of information is possible through the, the uh, common rules and the rules include uh, communication rules. So what are the methodology we use for communication? What are the methodology we use for uh, data distribution? And what also the methodology for security? And uh, at, the, at the base of all of this, there is the IT station architecture that, that was already introduced uh, earlier on, so I will not insist on that. But what is imp very important is that this uh, architecture has been defined uh, for CITS services, but basically CITS services is, is something that uh, has to be brought into uh, a situation where we need to share information between different domains. So basically the ITS station architecture is applicable to many use cases to the condition that we want to expand uh, uh, the, the sharing of data. Uh, next one, please. So uh, the idea is, uh, of course, that uh, when we exchange data, we also need to do it in a secure way in a, uh, and in a universal way. So the question is how the vehicle could share information with other vehicles, with the roadside infrastructure, with the personal IT stations, nomadic devices, etc., and also with server in the cloud in the most uh, efficient way, but with security. And of course, uh, the vehicle will be in different situations all the time. So there is no, not a single technology that could uh, 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 I would say apply to all the use case. It has to be technology agnostic. In the, in the, in the most, if, uh, the, the, if if possible, it has to be uh, uh, totally independent of the underlying technology. This is not today the case. Today, the services that are deployed uh, for connected vehicle, for connected roadside, etc., are usually usually defined per domain. And this is one of the reasons that prevent the uh, efficient share of data between all those domains. So once we, 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 we are in this cooperative ITS world where we need to change, uh, exchange the data, we need to agree on this common way for communication. So the architect ITS station architecture has been designed for, designed for that, but now we also need to look into the way security uh, is, uh, is uh, um, defined and, uh, and uh, deployed for uh, connected vehicle, cooperative vehicle, and of course automated vehicle. Uh, so next, next slide, please. So here, uh, first, we, we uh, uh, the people who are the most familiar with CITS services uh, know also that uh, there is uh, um, most of the services that are deployed today rely mostly on a broadcast uh, distribution of data in a very uh, localized area. So we call this localized communication, and this is uh, means communication without support from the telecom infrastructure. We also speak about V2X in this situation when it's uh, the, the, uh, the communication between the vehicle and the roadside infrastructure. This has been uh, uh, under development for many years now with pilot deployment in many countries like Sea uh, Road. So Asfinag is one, uh, uh, as, uh, stakeholders, Aventi and, and Norway are also important players in this uh, de deployment. But what is important to know here is that uh, this exchange of data has been uh, secure 
by the by the uh, the use of uh, certificates. So it's certificates that are designed developed by uh, I Triple E. So it's P sixty nine. Uh, dot two certificate uh, that are used for the authentication of the sender and the non-repudiation of the of the data that is transmitted. So this is very important uh, to to apply this security because this is what gives trust to the information that is shared. And the the, tr the, the trust of information was already emphasized by Bjorg uh, earlier on. So this is very critical and. This is what has been defined specifically for our CITS services. At that time, it was designed for developed for uh, broadcast services, but we have looked into how it could be uh, generically applicable to other CITS services. So you can go to the next one. So basically, uh, those certificates needs a, a very complex uh, system for managing the, the credential to manage the certificate. For so first, we need to have a certificate agency, uh, an authority, and we need to provide a certificate to all the IT stations that are deployed in the vehicle and the roadside and also in other uh, equipment. So this is a complex slide here that illustrates the, uh, the, um, the, um, the system that I took from the uh, European Commission, the EU CCMS, so that means the Security Commercial Management System. And uh, I provided the link be, uh, below uh, so that you could check the document. So this is the, the uh, just a copy from the, one of the documents there. So this system is deployed for cooperative ITS services. Uh, it is based on standards that have been developed by HC uh, in addition to the certificate developed by IEEE. And of course, it uh, could be used for uh, um, most of the deployment of CITS. It's, it's not a requirement. It means that other uh, stakeholders could de uh, or deploy their own, uh, I would say, equivalent of CCMS or their own uh, system for security credential based on the same standard. But the European Commission has put in place this uh, CCMS for all the stakeholders that, that wants to uh, um, uh, deployed CITS services without taking care about their own uh, deployment of uh, certificate uh, system. So, next slide, please. So, in in uh, the question is, of course, how to the first the system here is is used for communication between uh, uh, vehicles or so broadcast communication between a vehicle that implement ITS. Uh, 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 services based on the IT station architecture. So I always put this picto here on, on the vehicle to show that those vehicles are speaking the same language, so the same communication architecture. Uh, so here I want to say that the secret, the, the European, C, oh, the equivalent of uh, uh, security management system it is applicable, of course, for localized communication. It has been designed for that. But uh, it's not only, uh, next slide, it's not only for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, of course, it's also for vehicle-to-roadside because uh, for, for application like SPAT and MAP so that uh, we already illustrated in, in this uh, webinar today. So for uh, also broadcast communications. But it's also, and you can go to the next one, it's also applicable for um, communication with uh, other peers remotely, so in long-range communications. And that means not uh, broadcast communication in this situation, but point-to-point -point communication between the vehicle and uh, potentially uh, 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 central uh, traffic world control centers. Uh, could be uh, communication with uh, uh, other vehicles through the cloud. It could be communication uh, with roadside equipment through the cloud uh, and also to a personal device. And the personal device may be a, a very long uh, uh, long distance communication using cellular, but it could also be a, a short distance communication when the personal device are brought into the, the vehicle. This is generally the case for uh, personal uh, uh, um, device like smartphone, etc., that are, could be used uh, to book a vehicle, to open the door of the vehicle and to do many other uh, services. So we need also to establish trust between those uh, different equipment that speak the IT, IT station uh, communication uh, language uh, and architecture. So here we are in a situation where uh, we need to secure the link between uh, the, uh, the, so the, the point to point link between those two IT stations. And what has been uh, adopted is to use exactly the same uh, uh, technologies. So you can go to the next one. Uh, 
By the same technology, I mean that we are using uh, the same certificate, uh, the same type of certificate that have been put in place for broadcast communication. So there is a standard that is ISO 21177, uh, that is a secure session between ITS uh, stations. It's uh, published last year, so it's very recent uh, uh, um, uh, uh, standard. It was already uh, um, discussed in one of the pre uh, previous uh, webinars, but it's not yet very well known uh, uh, standard yet because it's too, too uh, very, very recent. This uh, standard, this ISO standard, is using so the certificate, the IEEE uh, P1609.2 certificate, in addition to TLS 1.3. TLS is, uh, is a very common uh, uh, um, uh, standard uh, defined for security uh, in many areas, not only for ITS. So it's uh, um, our, rec our recognition of using established technologies so that means a TLS technology plus a certificate for broadcast communication applicable ap uh, applied for uh, secu to, uh, to secure station between the vehicle and other uh, communication peers. There is also, of course, a need for adaptation of TLS 1.3 uh, uh, to, towards this uh, um, application domain. And uh, this was uh, um, uh, st standardized as a RFC so RFC is a, it's a standard from the IETF. The IETF is a standardization organization in charge of uh, internet protocols. So it's a very generic uh, organization. And this RFC, so this standard 8902 was also published last year. Uh, so it's very recent. So all of those things together means that we, are, we can now start to use the similar uh, uh, security credential system. So the European CCMS could be used for also for secure session. Why it's important? It's important because secure session could be used uh, for many uh, uh, use cases, over, uh, software over the air update, for instance, but also for remote uh, uh, driving, if we need to, in the situation of uh, shutters, where we need to have an operator taking care of uh, uh, a vehicle that is, uh, um, that may have a broken sensor or other situation that could not be, uh, uh, I would say, uh, performed by autonom autonomously, it might need an uh, operator to take uh, control of the vehicle uh, through, through, uh, remotely. So in this case, we also need to have a secure station. All applications related to telemetry, applications uh, related to uh, um, uh, video streaming or so whatever that um, are, are very important for for security and also all the communication that could be established between a vehicle and the roadside environment after a publication of a services to say okay we need to engage in a very point-to-point uh, -point communication because the way I gave an example of a vehicle take, uh, approaching a city and it, it, it's uh, using broadcast communication you could uh, 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 get information from the from the road, uh, road signs, uh, the, uh, the traffic lights, and that kind of things. But after getting this information, you may want to engage into a direct communication with the roadside in order to provide uh, other information, like how many people you have on the vehicles, what's the reason why you are coming to their cities, and maybe you have to pay uh, a fee. And that means that uh, the follow uh, as at the, after receiving a broadcast message, you need to engage into a point-to-point -point communication. So with those standards, we are able to use exactly the same uh, system, the same certificate, the same uh, organization of uh, security credential, and that means it expands the scope of applicability of, of the CITS uh, 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 standard that has been designed originally for uh, broadcast communication. Next one, please. So in addition to a, a secure session, of course, we also need to have universal access to the data uh, between different ITS stations. So that could be the vehicle or, or also roadside equipment. And this is another standard. So that's the ISO 17429 series. It's currently one document that is it's going to be uh, re uh, refactorized, uh, refactored, and uh, um, sp uh, sp spread. Uh, sorry, split into several parts. Uh, and one of the parts is uh, going to describe the a, a service for publication of subscribes. It could be MQTT, as as Björk already mentioned before. So MQTT is a, the standard that is uh, uh, used in many situations, ITS services, including CITS. 
but there is no yet uh, decision uh, on which uh, uh, protocol has to be uh, standardized as a minimum uh, 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 functionalities to ensure interoperability between all the IT stations. So one of the uh, candidates, of course, is MQTT, and the next step in the standardization activity will be to uh, uh, um, to um, to integrate uh, MQTT as uh, one of the function in in this 17429 uh, document. Uh, okay, so that's uh, basically uh, I think the, the getting to the last line now. Uh, yeah, so as as a summary, I've put a list of standards that are very important for understanding uh, and deploying CITS services, I mean, trusted CITS services based on uh, a common approach for security. So there is a CCMS information that's uh, on the top. Then there is the, a document for uh, guidelines. So ISO 21186 is also a document published last year. Uh, in multi-parts, so there's multiple parts, and uh, those documents are there to highlight and to give uh, more information about uh, CITS uh, functionalities. The IT station architecture, so it's very important, it's a core standard, and the secure station between trusted device is another very important component for uh, achieving uh, the applicability of, uh, of ISO and CITS services for autonomous vehicles and other information that you may find useful if you need to find more information. I also want to mention that about the Secretas project, it's a European project uh, currently running um, uh, until the end of the year that is working on uh, many security uh, issues related to uh, um, connected vehicles. It includes also access to sensor information, V2S communications and uh, secure stations. So it's multiple projects. But it, this project is is also taking a, a lot of uh, uh, making a lot of progress in the cyber security uh, uh, application to uh, world's uh, connected cooperative and autonomous vehicles. And so this is uh, the, the the information I wanted to provide. And of course, if you have any questions on, on that, uh, we uh, will be very uh, happy to to answer this. Yeah, and I see that Bjorn uh, has uh, put information about the IT station architecture. So, yes, and yes, it's all fashion actually diagram that uh, um, that are there in Stena for uh, because it was it started two, 10 years ago. Uh, what I want to say is that the the IT station architecture is is was first published in 2010. But it was the result of a work that started in 2020 at, uh, no, in 2020, uh, so it means 20 years ago at uh, uh, ISO TC204. But the, the, the ISO standard has been uh, rev uh, revised a few times and there's a new version from uh, last year. So it's uh, the, the, the diagram look are uh, all fashion, but the content is, uh, is uh, conti continuously improved and up to date. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terry. Um, I think Björn still had a question about P1609.2 certificates to be used uh, to download HD maps uh, from the Norwegian Mapping Authority. Yeah, this is possible. Uh, yeah, of course. So, uh, digital maps is probably one of the uh, very important application of uh, of this standard. I mean, autonomous vehicle. We need to have extended view of the road, and uh, it's not possible to embark, to to have already pre preset this information in the vehicles uh, and unless we speak about autonomous shuttles that are always taking the same uh, uh, following the same routes every time but for other vehicles that we need to move from country to country city to cities and it's not possible to uh, to have uh, a digital um, hd map uh, so the, the best way is to upload uh, the information uh, uh, as uh, according to the progress of the of the itinerary, and this of course uh, might uh, be uh, transmitted. Uh, some some part of the digital map may be transmitted from the cloud, but it's also possible that some part of the map is uh, uh, transmitted uh, point to point uh, from the roadside infrastructure when you are stopped at the traffic light or when you get into a highway, for instance. Uh, and whatever the situation, it will be point to point distribution of data. And for that, you need to secure because 
probably uh, uh, you may have different uh, level of quality of maps according to the type of vehicles, maybe according to the type of uh, rights that are associated with the vehicles. So you may have different rights for a uh, personal vehicle compared to lorries or buses, etc. And um, that makes sense that in a situation where you have different information, you provide diff different uh, uh, data, and then, of course, you need to secure this uh, for, uh, by security, I mean, not only authentication and non repudiation but also uh, encryption uh, yeah. of data. Okay. Thank you so much, Thierry. Uh, for that detailed uh, presentation, very good. We will share the presentations, as I said in the beginning, as well as PDFs uh, to all of you later. Uh, of from that is thank you. Thank you. And from that, it's actually very good um, moving from trust and authentication to cybersecurity challenges uh, using AI and in automated vehicles. And we will hear from Ronan Hamon. And uh, hello and welcome. And thank you yes. for joining us. Hello. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, so you can see my presentation. We right? can see it, please. OK, great. So uh, welcome. Um, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Ronald Armand. I work at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And today I will present a report uh, that is a result of a collaboration between GSC and the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, ENISA. And I will discuss the cybersecurity challenges in the uptake of artificial intelligence in autonomous driving. So the, the question has been raised in the chat about the difference between autonomous and automated. So I will not provide an answer, we'll just explain uh, how I consider autonomous driving, I will consider it in this presentation. And this is the case where the vehicle is responsible for the maneuvers. So the, there is no uh, interaction or a very limited interaction between uh, the passengers and the vehicle. Uh, before going into the content of the report, I will quickly uh, present the Joint Research Center, uh, as some of you may not be aware of what it is. So GRC is the knowledge service of the European Commission, and its mission is to support EU policies by providing a scientific expertise on a various range of policy relevant topics. GRC is mainly composed of scientific and technical staff, and it does not have, contrary to other departments of the Commission, a policy agenda, but instead it works with other departments uh, to support policy making. So as a research centre, we, uh, we are also working on foresight, and this is what the report is about, anal analysing the, uh, the cybersecurity challenges of uh, next generation uh, vehicles and especially specifically the use of AI in autonomous driving. So to quickly give an idea of the current policy landscape on the topic, here is a non-exhaustive list of European initiatives in the past years around CITS and cybersecurity. Some of them have already been discussed and uh, mentioned today. Uh, of relevance too are the um, Network and Information Security Directive and the General Data Protection Regulations that uh, set out important principles regarding cybersecurity and autonomous decision-making system based on personal data. So this may be complemented in the future by a regulation on artificial intelligence, where the proposal has uh, been published uh, last week, and uh, that adds up to the initiatives from the European Commission to build a trustworthy AI that is of particular importance for autonomous driving. Uh, before jumping on autonomous driving, I will provide a short definition of what is AI. So AI is a very broad concept that groups many ideas and techniques. And if we refer to the definition given by the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence, uh, so this concerns systems that act in the physical or digital world by perceiving, interpreting data, reasoning, and deciding the best action to take. So as such, AI is at the core of the research works to develop autonomous driving. And uh, yes, driving is a complex task and it requires mimicking advanced connective capabilities in an environment designed by and for humans. And as it has been uh, highlighted in, in, in the chat, uh, it is uh, unlikely that uh, the, uh, the full uh, road uh, infrastructure will be composed of autonomous vehicle, but there will be an hybrid situation where uh, 
autonomous vehicle may have to evolve uh, with uh, human drivers or uh, semi-automated uh, or uh, partially automated vehicles. But machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, techniques have been widely used for these tasks, and, uh, and they differ from the traditional techniques by the fact that the mechanisms in play in the decision-making processes are not hard-coded by the designer, but instead they are inferred from a large volume of data. And in particular, the subfield of deep learning has been a game changer in the building of systems that exhibit cognitive capabilities. And those techniques are now ubiquitous in current prototypes of fully automated vehicles. So here is uh, a quick illustration to, to show the change of paradigm and how deep learning works on the simple example of traffic sign classification. So before deep learning, the classification was typically done by hard coding important features, such as the shape, the, the color, or the markings. Uh, with deep learning models, given an image, the model is able to extract itself the relevant patterns and combine them to form the final decision. So this allows for much more flexible patterns that can take uh, into account the enormous variability of images and situations that may happen. But the downside of that is that the logic of the decision making is hidden in the parameters of the model and may not be neither visible nor well aligned with the logic used by humans. So this is this misalignment and the opaqueness of models that are exploited by attackers to deceive AI systems. Uh, the development of AI system can be decomposed in two steps, roughly speaking. Uh, first, the training that relies on, on the model, on a large collection of data and on algorithms uh, which are feeding the model to the data to accomplish a given task. So in this basic example, classifying cars and bikes. So at the deployment stage, the train model is embedded in a car and uh, the user provides an input. Um, here, the image of a car and gets an input. This is a car. So, so this is simplification and in practice, the de deployment takes place in a pipeline that can include several AI and non-AI systems linked together. But this is to give an idea of how things are done. So for this uh, report, we restricted our analysis to uh, autonomous and fully automated, uh, uh, semi-autonomous vehicles. So where the, the, um, the driver uh, do not cannot uh, change the decision um, uh, taken by by a vehicle, and we focus on the AI components of these vehicles uh, uh, based on the sensors. So, autonomous driving is typically divided into three main functions: perception, planning, and control. And these components take the inputs from the sensors of the vehicle, the cameras, lidars, radars, and so on and uh, can also take external information from uh, HD maps or from the infrastructure. So uh, machine learning has been mainly used so far in perception tasks, and I will focus on that in the rest of the presentation, but it's getting also more and more used for planning purposes uh, for its uh, ability to, to reproduce some form of human behaviors. Uh, regarding perception tasks, AI is used for three main subfunctions: seeing and understanding, that uh, includes the, in the identification of roads and lanes, detection of vehicles, pedestrian, object, traffic sign, etc. The same flow estimation to track and predict the trajectory of moving agents and objects, and finally, scene representation to build the representation of the environment that is suitable for planning purposes. For these tasks, state-of-the-art techniques are based not exclusively, but mostly on deep learning techniques, either in separate components chained together for each of the subtasks or in end-to-end -end systems. So cybersecurity is an important aspect to take into account to build uh, trust in, in the technology and favor the adoption of uh, auto autonomous vehicles. The presence of these AI components inside digital inside digital systems are opening is opening a new class of vulnerabilities, and uh, this increases the attack surface of uh, vehicles. So, in particular, the fact that machine learning systems in autonomous vehicles are connected to the actuators of the vehicles, uh, this can lead to a high impact in case of a security incident uh, affecting the AI components. Among the main vulnerabilities of AI, we can cite adversarial attacks, 
uh, that uh, consists in adding wrong data, uh, no, sorry, uh, that consists in deceiving AI models, data poisoning, that consists in adding wrong data during the, the, the training uh, stage, data leakage and model theft, that consists in stealing uh, uh, either the data used for the training or the models themselves, or backdoors that can be placed inside models to trigger specific misbehaviors. So as of now, adversarial attacks are the main threats for automated driving, and we insist on that uh, now. So if we go back to the previous pictures on the development of AI systems, we consider this time a malicious user. An adversarial attack happens when the adversary sends an altered version of the input to the AI system. So for a human, the image is still the same. Here it is still a car, but the system will classify the image as a bike because of the perturbation. And this perturbation uh, is specifically crafted to deceive the system. So here it is, in a, uh, it is an illustration of the same phenomenon, but on a real image. Uh, and you can see on the bar plot the scores uh, returned by the system for each of the labels, uh, car or bike. And uh, the score returned by the system is higher for car on the original in the original image, but after adding the, the perturbation, which is here amplified, and I'm not even sure that with the resolution of the screen sharing, you are able to see the perturbation. But the score changes, and now the output level is the bike, despite the image still shows the car. So in the report, we provided we designed five scenarios in which attacks against AI components are involved. I will present now two of them that are based on the adversarial attack I have just uh, described. So the first scenario, a malicious, uh, in the first, um, a malicious actor applies a sticker on the, stock, on the stop marking of the road. So this is captured by the camera of the vehicle that processes the image. And in a normal situation, the system would have detected the markings but because of the presence of the sticker, the system is now deceived and does not detect the marking line. So this may lead the planning system to act as if the car has priority in the intersection. In the second scenario, the malicious actor gained access to the vehicle system by exploiting a vulnerability uh, of the digital system, either physically or remotely, uh, for instance, through the infotainment system. The adversary can then tamper with the communication channels between AI components and in this case make warning signs to be interpreted as indica indication signs. Here again with potential high impact on the safety of the vehicles. So this scenario is an, an example of the combination of traditional and AI cybersecurity where both uh, um, the vulnerabilities can be exploited and uh, both can be, uh, can be used to attack the vehicles. And uh, uh, actually, most, attack, most cybersecurity attacks are a combination of different attacks and not only one single attack. Uh, we uh, reproduced partially these scenarios in our lab uh, where we deceive state-of-the-art object detection models trained for traffic sign recognition to output uh, here multiple signs uh, all over the image uh, when uh, a light perturbation is added. On the left, the original image with the right detection, and on the left, an overflow attack where the signs are detected all over the image. We also deceive the system by spoofing the type of a sign uh, that is uh, uh, predicted by adding a sticker on it. So here it is done digitally, but the same kind of attack could be done physically. And in that case, the keep right sign is det detected as a priority right sign. So uh, all the experiments have also been conducted by research groups all over the world, and I will not go into details for lack of time, but this list shows that these vulnerabilities are already present in the assistance systems of modern vehicles that are powered by AI. So this is not, even if the, the report focuses on autonomous uh, vehicles. This is already uh, a problem for the assistance uh, systems of uh, modern vehicles. To end this presentation, I will uh, quickly uh, present the main recommendation we drew up uh, in the report. Uh, broadly speaking, they focus first on the technical challenges linked to the use of AI, and in particular, the fact that AI is a rapidly evolving field that is still under development, and then there is a lack of technical tools to properly support the verification, certification, and auditing of AI system uh, in the case, for instance, of a cybersecurity attack. 
This is all the more needed as machine learning models are opaque and getting an explanation of a given decision may not be possible or at least may be complica is complicated. In that sense, a start on testing procedure may have to be updated to properly assess the safety and the security of vehicles uh, and uh, have to take into account the specificities of AI. The second aspect is about development processes and how cybersecurity principles are integrated in the full life cycle of products. AI has its own supply chain that is complex and involves many assets that should be properly secured. There might be also a need to increase the level of awareness of the vulnerabilities in AI systems and of related cybersecurity principles among all, all stakeholders involved in the development of autonomous vehicles and also of the infrastructure that will accompany it. So in this respect, fostering a joint expertise in AI, cybersecurity and automotive may be important to ensure that both traditional and AI software embedded in autonomous systems are secure. So this is the end of my presentation. The full report is available in the GRC Science app if you're interested and want to learn more. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you, Ronan, so Thank much you, for that. Thank you, so much for that. I'm uh, uh, a question from Bjorn in uh, the uh, chat, but I would just like to ask you, what do you think um, the attacking, spoofing and jamming, do you think that is the most kind of um, challenges against trust in automated driving from the from a from a normal person standing on the road is that why we're um, it will take longer uh, before we have full auto automated driving in, in the streets do you think that is the trust uh, and can AI, ai help to uh, work on that trust issue yes so the, the ai will add an additional complexity to, to build the trust of autonomous system. And autonomous systems are mainly based, at least uh, regarding the, the uh, 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 when they are not supported by, by proper infrastructure, by AI techniques. So, yeah, you, you mentioned jamming uh, of uh, sensors, and this is a way to attack the systems. So if the, but, but the, uh, uh, if uh, uh, this kind of attack are possible and the AI system is not able to handle those kind of issues. The fact that the AI is in charge of, of driving and can act, can accelerate, can turn, can will cause uh, um, issues. So there's safety issues uh, that um, uh, mostly refers to unintentional threats. So in the case where there's no uh, an intentional, um, uh, intentional uh, meaning, uh, unintentional meaning behind and security also because those systems like all digital systems will be uh, attacked and will be the subject of uh, coordinated attack at different levels from simple ones to very sophisticated ones. So yes, AI, the integration of AI uh, is uh, problematic to build the trust, but at the same time it is it has to be taken into account because this is the core technologies in uh, autonomous vehicles. Thank you. That's the question. And would you kind of conclude that it's better for automated vehicles to receive road sign information from CITS instead of relying on cameras? Yes. Uh, so all the initiatives to to complement the the, uh, the the information and to have a, a more reliable information is uh, will be uh, a way to ensure that systems are working well, but. We need also to take into account the case where those uh, sensors may uh, malfunction or a situation where those if this infrastructure is not available. So uh, having, sensor, uh, having uh, sensors uh, uh, sensors did, um, did we lose Ronan now? Yeah, I lost him too. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ronan. I'm sorry for that. We kind of lost you there. Um, assistance of an infrastructure to provide information. Sorry, there you are back. We we kind of lost you for a second there at the end. Ah. Um, uh, so if you want to kind of uh, say what you said the last uh, 10 seconds, <laughs> if you yes. remember. Now, the main message is that uh, the CITS infrastructure will help complement uh, 
uh, will provide information uh, that will be useful, but we also need to take into account the case where this infrastructure may not be present or may not function correctly. And uh, AI uh, uh, situation where the AI will only the, the system will only rely on the sensors and on deep learning models needs to be uh, considered. And also AI will be used for planning purposes. And for this situation, the infrastructure, uh, knowing there's a stop sign is important, but knowing that you need to stop uh, uh, when there's a stop sign is also uh, the, the aim of the, of the planning. Uh, and this cannot be uh, well provided. The planning decision cannot be uh, well uh, enforced to vehicles. And in this way, AI is important to secure. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ronan, for joining us today and uh, uh, for those insights. Uh, we will move on to the final presentation of today from Gerard Segara, and uh, he will talk about the interactions between automated vehicles and the infrastructure. Um, Gerard? Yes, yes okay, Jenny. Can... Yes, I can hear you. Well. You can take the, uh, take the presentation for me. Yes. I will try to find that and you can introduce Thank you. yourself. Thank you. There we go. Yes, please. Okay. So uh, yeah, I've been working for 30 years in uh, Renault Nissan. So I am coming from the vehicle side. So I started my uh, company uh, in 2014 It's uh, as a consultant. And I am a convener of this uh, TC226 working group 12. So uh, <clears throat> we, at the beginning, we were talking about autonomous vehicles, but uh, we want, uh, didn't want to use this word because we consider that uh, a vehicle will be never autonomous. Uh, it will be under the responsibility of uh, humans, uh, fortunately. Uh, it will be to uh, execute the goals of humans, for example, uh, going from one point to another. Uh, it will be programmed for that. But uh, it will be also uh, needed, uh, needing uh, some uh, road infrastructure uh, for doing that. Uh, if not, there is no uh, matter for uh, us to work on the uh, interaction between automated vehicles and the road infrastructure if the vehicle is completely autonomous. So we can go to the next slide, please. So the TC226 is a road equipment domain, uh, which is uh, for road equipment suppliers. So uh, we have a number of uh, working groups which are active, but they were focusing on the interaction between human driven vehicle on the road infrastructure. But the appearance now, the appearing of the uh, automated vehicles will be changing a certain number of things at the level of the road infrastructure is why this working group 12 has been created uh, in order to, to study the new interaction which will be generated for the uh, uh, deployment of automated vehicles. Next slide, please. So the general objective of the working group are to, uh, to support the TC226 members to fully understand the possible interaction between road equipment and automated vehicles. This uh, from SAE level one to five, that is to say partly automated until fully automated vehicles. Of course, ensure consistency between road infrastructure and vehicle standards, enabling theft and interval ITS. We don't want to specify directly standards because we consider that there is enough uh, working groups which are which are developing standards from uh, SEN, from Etsy, from ISO. So we are just uh, expressing the view of the uh, road equipment suppliers through technical reports and guides. And of course, we will work with uh, other TC to organize working group. Uh, about the uh, necessary, necessary standard evolution, preparing the introduction of automated vehicles in an hybrid vehicle on the environment, because uh, for a long time, automated vehicles will be cohabiting with uh, non-connected vehicles uh, and so on. Of course, we cannot do that alone. We have to, do, to achieve that in strong cooperation with the vehicle industry on the road management operation. 
and we will focus on short term deployment through to five years on, on standard which are judged necessary for such deployment. Next slide. So for the for the moment, the uh, working group 12 is organized into four task groups. The TG1 is uh, focusing on the augmented perception. That is to say, uh, this includes the autonomous perception of the vehicle, plus the collaborative perception, which is obtained uh, through cooperation between uh, vehicle and vehicle infrastructure and so on. The TG2 is uh, working on strategic survey on the uh, studying the deployment of the vehicle uh, for medium term and long term. The, for the TG3 is working on uh, priority application use cases, application on use cases. Uh, I will uh, enter into more detail uh, later on. On the, the TG4 is working on the infrastructure digital screen which is, of course, an, an important matter also uh, uh, associated to the uh, real uh, road infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So, of course, we are focusing on the uh, ITS architecture, which has been developed by SEN ISO uh, We We know that we have four levels in this architecture coming from portable devices, which is associated to uh, vulnerable road users, for example. We have the vehicle uh, layer, uh, we have the road equipment uh, layer, and we have the central station. So uh, all the three lower layers are, have uh, autonomous uh, perception because they have uh, sensors, they, are, they have cameras, they have uh, LIDAR, radars, and so on. Uh, the problem of the central station is that the central station has no uh, non-perception. No perception, so it, the central station shall get the perception of local environment from the other layers. That would be an issue. So uh, in terms of connectivity, of course, all these four layers have to uh, uh, cooperate together. And we have a uh, short range and long range uh, connectivity as it has been already presented uh, before. So uh, for each uh, layer, each, uh, we have an ITSS for each uh, equipment. And of course, we have a certain number of other functions like the collision risk analysis, for example, dynamic navigation and so on. In fact. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, interaction uh, between uh, the road infrastructure and the vehicles, we have identified three categories of interaction. The autonomous interactions, which are uh, achieved by sensors on ADAS, uh, which are under the responsibility of TG1. Uh, that is to say that a direct interaction between the road infrastructure, the horizontal marking on the vertical signing, for example, on the vehicle. Then we have the uh, cooperative interaction, which is also called connectivity. And, uh, and we have uh, local cooperation uh, using uh, local area networks, ad hoc networks, but also we have uh, long range co cooperation using uh, cellular networks and so on. And then we have what we call the model based interaction based on the digital map. Of course, when we mention the digital map, we uh, include the uh, digital geographic map, or the HD, HD map, but also all the dynamic uh, uh, objects which are moving, uh, which are progressing on the road and so on. And this is under the responsibility of the TG4. Next slide. So the uh, working group 12 approach has been starting from the services. For example, we have the different categories of services, safety, team, traffic management, mobility, what we call also mass, mobility as a service. And we have applications which are supporting the services on the uh, use cases, which are uh, the specific situation uh, in which we are apply applying these applications. So we are now focusing more on application on use cases 
and try to identify what are the uh, applications and use cases which will be deployed in a short term in order to focus our uh, action or our pro work program on the application and services on the use cases which will be deployed in a short term. We have also some uh, main questions, on, especially in terms of distribution of the processing intelligence, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, on the, the distribution of the data in the four layers. We can uh, have different uh, uh, models for the distribution of the intelligence on the data. On the main issue we have is that uh, the fact that the central uh, supervisor, for example, which is necessary uh, when uh, level four and level five vehicles don't have human driver in it, uh, uh, don't have a local uh, perception. So we, it will be necessary to uh, provide this local perception uh, from the local environments, from uh, the vehicles, from the uh, vulnerable road users, but also from the road uh, side infrastructure. Uh, that will be big data which has to be uh, forwarded, in fact, to the uh, central stations. And then the central station could have some control after that on the vehicles in case of uh, problem at the vehicle level, but also in case of interception by the police, for example, it could be necessary in some cases to uh, stop a vehicle for different uh, purposes. Next one. So uh, we uh, started some uh, inquiry. We started a technical report, which is a 00 to 226, 260 which will be published uh, very soon now, it's uh, in the finalization. Uh, this uh, technical report uh, will be our framework in order to support the work program of the Working Group 12. So we try to identify application on use cases which, have, uh, which will be deployed in a short term, that is to say between three and five years, in order to identify which standards are required, are necessary for this, this deployment. The result of this uh, short inquiry we have been doing is a uh, per order of priority. We have the conceptual dedicated corridor management. Uh, that is to say, uh, we will have to manage uh, the uh, road infrastructure in such a way to, in some cases, uh, reserve some lands for the for specific vehicles, for example, for emergency vehicles or for electrical vehicles or for non-polluting vehicles, or for also roadwork vehicles, or winter intervention vehicles, and so on. So that uh, would say the first uh, application we have to focus on. Then we have the road infrastructure support to vulnerable road user safety. We know that now we have a new standard which has been issued by the Etsy, which is called the VBS, Vulnerable Basic Service which also contain uh, uh, the VAM, the Vulnerable Awareness Message. That's a new message. So how do we use this uh, uh, service on message, for example, for the uh, protection of the uh, VRU? We have also the parking management. Our, all what is uh, black is a generic, a generic application, which can be applied to any kind of uh, environment, highway, urban or interurban, for example. What is red is uh, more applicable to the highway, and we have the approaching and tolling barrier, which is also a use case which is important uh, for uh, uh, highway operators, for example. We have, of course, this uh, issue of accurate roadmap, uh, which is a digital twin, in fact, uh, which should be uh, very accurate and complete. Uh, and we have uh, the TG4, which is working on this uh, question. We have the dynamic navigation because uh, we may have some uh, local events which are planned, which will be changing. No, no, uh, go back, please. I, I, I have not finished the uh, previous one. Sorry, Jenny? that was, yes, sorry, that was my, my mistake. I was too no. quick on that one. <laughs> yes, yes. Please just, continue and I will just find the presentation and then I will share it on the last and uh, next. Uh, there we go. Yes. And yes. it's only one minute, please. 
<laughs> yes, so Thanks. I will try to go with. Uh, dynamic navigation because we will have to change, in fact, the itinerary for some reasons, uh, some uh, broad hazard, for example, or some uh, plan events. We have the intersection crossing assist, which is uh, very important for automated vehicle because it's uh, it's difficult to have a good perception when we are in, in an intersection. And of course, the platooning, which will be uh, deploying on a highway. So we can go to the next slide, on which will be the last one, I think. So we have the standardization priorities. So uh, we have to identify now the uh, priorities, standardization priorities related to identify priority application on use case short term deployment. Uh, and we will develop technical reports for each uh, type of application uh, with their use case. So uh, with, with this will be consisting to analyze the existing standard, send ISO ATC standards, what we, we can use them, identify overlapping with between existing standards for the choice or harmonization of the standard to be used. Analysis also of the uh, current uh, standards which are under development. Uh, we have a new standard under development in SEN, ISO and uh, Etsy and uh, identify the needs for new standards. And this will be achieved via the development of relevant technical reports. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard, uh, on uh, that uh, presentation. And uh, it's an interesting working group indeed, uh, and it gives a lot of use cases that actually could be going into uh, some CCAM calls, as Björn is stating. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, it is when you have such large panelists of interesting speakers with an interesting and important topic uh, that the time almost runs out. I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank our experts uh, that joined us today and shared their knowledge and insight. And I would like to uh, thank you, the audience, for a good questions and comments in the chat. And as I said in the beginning, we will share this presentation. Uh, next CITS uh, webinar will be held in uh, June and we will talk more about business and business cases. So uh, thank you so much and have a lovely day today. Thank you. Bye bye.